All right, let's get underway. Um, you may recall that the power tripped off during class on Friday, and that interrupted the recorder that I use for our classes, and uh, the files corrupt. Uh, I'm still trying to see if there's some way to recover it, but uh, so far I haven't had any luck. So um, the lecture from Friday may be lost. That being the case, there's several other semesters with very similar material. So if you just look for the, uh, uh, I'll, I'll link the old semester's lecture on Blackboard if I can't find uh, a way to repair the one from Friday. So um, the homework assignment you've got right now includes the Hardy Cross method. And we've been through an example in class where you were solving for the flow rates using Hardy Cross, and we went through the process of calculating the pressure at junctions. Uh, the only way that the homework assignment is a little bit different is I believe that I've given you elevations on the homework assignment so that um, when you calculate the pressure at each junction, you're going to have to take into account the elevation and not just the total head at that spot. We also on Friday talked about water hammer and uh, how surge tanks can be used to reduce the, uh, the risk of damage from water hammer. So that assignment's due on Wednesday. Um, today we're moving on to chapter 9 in the book, and I hope that you are following along. It's not really that lengthy, lengthy from a reading perspective, so there's not an overwhelming amount of stuff to read, but I think it's worth following along in the text. Um, also, hopefully we'll have some time to work on a Hayes and Williams practice problem just to get some additional exposure to that. Um, we're going to just briefly take a look at one thing from a video related, to, great low rates. related to pumps. Let's get through the commercial here. All right, now this whole video is really good, but it's kind of long, so we won't be able to watch the whole thing. There we go. All right. So the, the thing I want to show you is that what we're going to see today is a graph where we've got flow rate on one axis and pump head on the other. And pump head is just another way of calculating the energy that the pump is adding to the system. And remember, in the energy equation, each of the terms has units of length, the pressure head, elevation head, and velocity head. In the form of the energy equation that we use it, are the, each of those terms are typically expressed in units of length. And so is pump head or the uh, head that's taken out by a turbine. Um, so they have a. Uh, a little figure that they're going to put on the screen here, an animation in just a moment, of a pump with a pipe. And so this is just so clever, the way that they've done it. Because in the past, I've always just thought of these figures of being kind of abstract, but they've thought of a way to actually bring it into the realm of reality, physical reality. So a pump is something that turns mechanical energy into fluid energy. And, of course, the mechanical energy comes from a motor. And a motor turns electrical energy into mechanical energy. So combining the two things together, a motor plus a pump, you're turning electrical energy into fluid energy. And so here, the pump is oriented so that the pipe is horizontal. And uh, since the pump isn't having to lift the water through any elevation, all of the energy would just be exerted overcoming the effect, effects of pipe friction. So it's going to be able to achieve a pretty high flow rate if this pipe was horizontal. But then if the, the pipe is inclined, the flow rate will decrease because not only are you still having to overcome the effects of pipe friction, but also you're lifting the water up in an elevation. So let's watch that little animation. So they're showing that at the beginning, when the pipe is horizontal, the flow rate is high. But then as they begin to incline it, meaning that now the effects of gravity have to be overcome and you're lifting the water, the flow rate decreases. And so that's what's being represented by this figure, is that 
um, if you're having to lift the water and it's working against more head, then the flow rate would be lower. And uh, if you're not lifting as much head, then the flow rate is higher. So like when this pipe was only partially inclined, the flow rate was lower than when it was all the way horizontal. When it was horizontal and it wasn't lifting against as much head at this point, then the, uh, then the flow rate was higher. So just think of the end of this pipe is, is tracing a curve, and we'll come back to this figure, but just kind of the, uh, the physical expression of that I thought was kind of clever. Um, the simplest kind of pumps are positive displacement pumps that are open to the atmosphere, uh, like a water wheel, or even just a, uh, you know, a bucket of water being lifted up from a well is a form of a pump. A bucket of water that's uh, you know, on the end of a string. If you're lifting water up out of a well, then you're turning the mechanical energy of, of your hands into the fluid energy, lifting the, the water elevation higher. It's got more potential energy. So in the case of a positive displacement pump like this screw pump, it's got a motor at the end. And if you submerged this uh, screw down into like a canal or a pond, then with each rotation of this pump, what it would do is if it's in a uh, shaft, like you can see it's open on one side, but it would be enclosed on the back and on the other sides. Um, as that screw rotates, it lifts the water up and then it can dump it at the top. So here it's adding energy not by pressurizing the fluid and uh, it's not by adding velocity to it because at the end of the trough, it's just dumping the water into another container, but it's adding energy by adding elevation. So the Z, as the water is lifted from some lower source to a higher source. But there's a lot of different types of positive displacement pumps. Uh, in the case of a rope pump like this, it is a flexible rope with plugs on it. And so you can see that the sizing of the plugs is set to coincide with the diameter of this pipe so that as you're rotating the rope and there's always going to be at least one of these plugs inside of the pipe and the way that you're able to continue to have water coming out of the spigot is just because with each inch that the plug is moving up through that confining pipe it's taking an inch of fluid with it and by the time it gets to here, the water could either continue upward or flow out the side. And since the side opening of the spigot is at a lower elevation, the water preferentially is going to go out the side rather than continue higher at an at a increased elevation. So this is turning mechanical energy into fluid energy. The water is moving inside of the pipe. It's gaining elevation. So it's maybe a, a great example of how a pump can work. But um, one pump that I had quite a lot of experience with when I was in graduate school was one that's called a peristaltic pump. And um, those are pretty common because the way they work is that you just have flexible tubing, just like plastic tubing, and um, a roller would constantly be rotating. And as long as the tubing had been primed and that there was a fluid or water inside of the tubing, then um, as it rotated, it would force the water out in front of the roller, and then water would be drawn in behind the roller to fill the void of the water that's pushed out of the way. Uh, and you can see that similar steps are used for an inter internal gear pump where it's just opening up a space, carrying the fluid with it, and then the space is closing off, so it's forced through the output side of the pump. And uh, so these are all just kind of novel ways of having, with a certain amount of rotation, a certain volume of water has to enter and exit the pump. But these are all pretty uncommon. <coughs> Rather than using positive displacement pumps, um, it's far more common for us to use radial flow pumps. Um, a radial flow pump uses the principles of, uh, of acceleration and it will have curved vanes or impellers that uh, are rotating and spinning and as water enters the pump through the suction side 
it encounters these spinning vanes that speeds up its velocity inside of the pump, within the pump, and thrusts it out through the pressure side. And so you can see that it's coming in and changing directions. It's kind of experiencing a 90 degree change in direction as it goes through the centrifugal pump. And um, at the other side of the pump, it would be connected to a motor. And uh, rather than lifting the water and increasing the elevation, um, this radial flow pump is increasing the pressure of the fluid uh, through the acceleration that's occurring. Um, axial flow pumps are similar in principle. They're also adding pressure. But the difference here is that rather than having the, uh, the water inside the pump casing when it's accelerated, with an axial flow pump, you're accelerating the water some distance away from the motor. And so you'd have impellers, which is very similar to like propellers. As you can see, it's angled. And it may have like a, uh, a wing-shaped taper that would also help to accelerate the fluid. Um, but with an axial flow pump, what you'd be able to do is, for example, you could have the motor at the surface, and you could submerge the impeller down below the surface. And so if you're trying to pump groundwater, you wouldn't necessarily have to have the pump beneath the Earth's surface where it would be overheating and hard to maintain and hard to get the electricity to. You could have the motor at the surface and then a pump casing with the impeller down below. Um, so you're essentially still doing the same thing. You're turning mechanical energy into fluid energy and you're adding additional pressure compared to the inlet and the outlet side of the pump. On the inlet side of the pump, the pressure is low. On the outlet, outlet side of the pump, the pressure is increased. Even if the velocity and the, uh, the elevation are the same, it's increased the amount of energy because there's been a, a direct and immediate increase in the pressure of the fluid. So the energy is added as a pressure increase. And this is just showing the idea of you know, a motor that's separated from the impeller. And, uh, and why you might be interested to do that is uh, we've talked about cavitation before and how if you have too much vertical separation between the pump and the liquid surface that you're drawing from, that the vapor pressure, remember, of the water is what governs whether cavitation will occur. And, and you may have a negative pressure in the suction side of a pump where negative relative to gauge the, uh, the pressure is getting closer and closer to the vapor pressure of the water. And that uh, if you have too long of a suction pipe or if the diameter is small and there's a lot of head loss in the suction side of the pipe, that those little um, vapor bubbles can form. And then as they collapse, it would cause pitting and damage to the pipe. So in a case like this, you wouldn't have the risk of cavitation because the impeller itself is beneath the water surface. Whereas if you are sucking the water through a suction tube, then the pressure is getting progressively lower and lower and closer to the vapor pressure on the suction side. But of course, as soon as the water's on the pressure side of the pump, after it's discharged out of the pump, the pressure is nice and high and there's no longer any risk of cavitation. Okay, so we saw the pump equation last semester in fluid mechanics and ideally when we haven't yet accounted for loss of energy due to inefficiencies then the pump equation would tell us how many watts are required to pump water at a certain flow rate given its known unit weight when we're adding a certain amount of pump head to the system and so this power equation would tell us in watts or if we're using traditional units, the number of horsepower that are required. Now, both the motor and the pump have inefficiencies. In the case of the motor, what's happening is that um, the motor may be warming up, and so the electrical energy that goes into it, not 100% of that electrical energy is turned into mechanical energy. And then the same thing with the pump. Uh, the pump is also heating up. It may have internal friction and uh, the water. You can actually sometimes measure the increase in temperature of water 
on the inlet versus the outlet side of a pump. And so there's going to be inefficiencies in the overall system. Efficiency is just the product of the efficiency of the motor and the pump. So the total amount of power required to add a certain amount of needed pump head to the system would be the ideal power divided by the efficiency factor. And these efficiency factors are less than one. It's usually expressed as a decimal. So maybe a typical pump and motor efficiency factor when you multiply them both together could be 0.7 or 0.75. So then if you're dividing the ideal pump power that's required by some fraction less than one, then that would increase the total amount of power that you have to put into the system to get the desired amount of energy into the fluid. And pumps operate differently depending on what fluid you're putting through it, the diameter of the pipe that's being used, the speed that it's rotating. There's a lot of variables involved. Um, and uh, so these performance curves can take those factors into account. And this is the shape that I was showing you with that YouTube video a few minutes ago where if the pump isn't working against much resistance, and so if there's a low amount of head that the pump is having to add to the system because maybe the delta Z isn't very big, that's, that would be one thing that would give you a low pump head is a small vertical deflection in the inlet and the outlet of the pipe. Or another thing could be if you have a large pipe diameter, then there's not going to be much friction losses. So then that would be another thing that would give you low pump head. So if you have a low pump head, one particular pump can achieve a much higher flow rate than if the pump head is higher, meaning you're working against more resistance, then it achieves a much lower flow rate. So here is just an example of what a typical pump performance curve may look like. It has an intercept, so 24.4 in this case is known as the shutoff head. And that's the, uh, the amount of pump head that could be added just before the flow rate gets to zero. And so what flow rate could it achieve? The, the maximum amount of head just before there's no flow rate left would in this case be 24.4 meters. And so that means that uh, it could never lift the water any higher than this shutoff head. So this has units of length, the pump head does. And so if you needed to lift the water more than the shutoff head, then you'd need to get a different, um, different pump. And then it, uh, it is declining. It's not linear. And so that's why we are squaring the flow rate here. There will be some coefficient in front of it that's been used to do curve fitting and uh, find out how does the, uh, the pump head decline as the flow rate increases. Now, this is called the pump performance curve. We can also make a curve of the system. And here's just a depiction of a typical system where we're drawing water from one tank through a pipe, and it's a pump that's causing the water to be able to flow uphill, and we're, we're lifting the water to an elevated tank because of this pump. And we could measure the delta Z, and we could quantify the inlet effects here of entering the water and there's a bend so that maybe it would be a k value from this bend another k value here a third a discharge so we could account for the local losses and also the pipe friction losses and from that we could construct what's known as a system curve and a system curve has on one axis the amount of pump head that's required and on another the flow rate so what you do is you would take the energy equation and you would rearrange it to have on one side of the energy equation the pump head and on the other the flow rate. So here's just an expression rearranging the energy equation. You know, normally the way we'd write the energy equation is V1 divided by gamma plus Z1 plus V1 squared divided by 2G plus H sub P uh, is equal to 
P2 divided by gamma plus Z2 plus V2 squared divided by 2G plus H sub F plus H naught plus H sub T, the turbine. Okay, so if we say that there's no turbine and uh, we together join the effects of here, the local losses, and here are the... Um, the friction losses, and so we're using the darcy Wiesbach equation for the friction losses. Uh, H sub F is F L V squared divided by D 2 G, and of course that also can be represented by F L Q squared divided by D 2 G A squared. So if we know flow rate rather than velocity, um, and H naught is K times V squared divided by 2G or K times Q squared divided by 2G A squared, then that's what we've got here in our system curve is we've just rearranged it to solve for when we're lifting from a tank that's open to the atmosphere like this, then P1 and V1 are zero, and the water's going to this elevated tank where it's open to the atmosphere, so there's not going to be any excess pressure. There's not going to be any remaining velocity once the water gets into the tank up here. So it's just the things that we're working against to lift the water are the difference in elevation, so Z1 versus Z2, and then the friction losses and the local losses. So the operating point then is where you have an intersection of the system curve and the pump curve. So remember, we could have a formula for both of these, and you solve for the common velocity and the common flow rate that sets the pump heads equal to each other. And so the problem solving approach here is just to solve for Q. Let the H sub P of the pump curve be equal to the H sub P of the system curve. The, the pump curve and the system curve equal to each other. Solve for the flow rate. Now, the tricky thing in using the darcy Wiesbach equation, of course, is that the friction factor F depends on the flow rate. So we'll start by assuming fully turbulent flow for a guess of the F value. And then once we have a guess of the F value, that enables us to solve for the flow rate. And then we can update the guess of the F value. All right. So what I've said is I've suggested we can find the operating point. You can find what is the flow rate by just setting H sub P equal to H sub P. So let's take a moment to uh, solve this example. We've got a pipe that's 120 meters long, and we know the diameter of the pipe, and we have an idea of its equivalent sand roughness. So we'd use this here in the uh, Jane equation. We know the local losses and the elevation change. Okay, so what you can use this for is to arrange the system curve. And we'll assume that we have some pump that has a cutoff head of 24.4 meters. And then the head that it's adding declines according to 7.65 times the flow rate squared. So um, first of all, find out what would be the F value for this system, and then substitute it into the system curve and set the H sub P of the system curve equal to the H sub P of the pump curve. OK, so the first thing we have to do is use the fully turbulent flow assumption to find out what is an estimate for the F value. And if we do that, you can see that we would estimate the F value to be 0 0.0196.
So we'll just start with that, and then we're going to have to check to see if that pulley turbulent flow assumption is reasonable. We can check either with a Moody diagram or just by recalculating the F value with the full Jane equation. So starting with that F value and substitute it into this rearranging of the system curve, then what we should get for the system curve is that we have to lift it at least 9.1 meters, and then for every cubic meter per second, that we achieve, there's another, well, for one cubic meter per second, it would be an extra 249.74 meters of head, but it's exponential. So this is just our system curve, and we set it equal to the pump curve. So on the left-hand side, you can see I've got the system curve, H sub P, is equal to the pump, head, the pump head's curve, and that was just a given. And Manufacturers will give you the pump head curve. Sometimes it'll come out of a figure that you would have to uh, you know, graphically um, substitute in different flow rates and you'd find out how much pump head could be achieved by the, uh, the pump that way. But uh, if you solve for Q, what you ought to get for this matching of the system curve and the pump curve is that the flow rate it's going to achieve is 0.244 cubic meters per second. Now, that was based on an assumption, the assumption of fully turbulent flow. So we can check that. Uh, just the way we would check it is calculate the flow velocity for this pipe diameter. And then once we know the flow velocity, we can calculate the Reynolds number. So let me just swap over to the Moody diagram. And let's see if we can find on the Moody diagram where we are, since that's the quickest way to see if we're in the fully turbulent flow range where F values don't really adjust anymore. I've probably got a Moody diagram. Here we are. All right. So what I calculated was that our uh, Reynolds number was 1.24 times 10 to the sixth. So here's. 1 times 10 to the 6th. And then we were up in the range of K sub S to D is 0 0.001. So 0 0.001, that's in the flat portion of the Moody diagram. And so the F value isn't going to change. And you could verify that by putting these values into the full, val uh, the full version of the Jane equation and just seeing that the F values within a couple of percent and so we don't need to recalculate everything with an updated F value. Any questions on how we find the flow rate when we're matching up a pump and a system? So in terms of homework problems, most probably what I would give you is just a description of what kind of pipes there are, the elevation difference between points. And you'd have to know that you're going to take this physical system and rearrange the energy equation to solve for H sub P. And then you'd match that up with the given pump and solve for the flow rate. So solve for the unknown Q. All right. So just as the last thing we're going to do today, we're going to take a, another look at the Hazen-Williams equation. Just reinforce practicing that formula. Here we've got a uh, SI units problem for Hazen-Williams. So We've got water flowing through a smooth plastic pipe. Nice high C value there. We know the diameter of the pipe and the flow rate here is 22 liters per second. So determine the pressure change between two points that are 250 meters apart. If the downstream location is 8.5 meters higher in elevation than the upstream location. All right, so we're trying to find out what is the pressure change, delta P. So not on the screen here. I haven't provided the uh, energy equation. I wrote it on the board a few minutes ago. But what you're going to do is you're going to use the Hazen-Williams equation to estimate the amount of head loss due to pipe friction. And of course, the pressure change is partly because of pipe friction, and it's partly because of this elevation difference. Okay, so let me pause for a second and give you a chance here to uh, solve for the delta P. Okay, we're nearly out of time, so let me just show you the solution to this one. You calculate the uh, cross-sectional area of the pipe, 
From that, determine the velocity of flow. And with that, we can calculate the head loss due to pipe friction. Now, according to this Hazen-Williams equation, remember that the C value is constant. So the advantage here is we don't have to iterate the F value like we would if we were using Darcy Wiesbach. Then rearranging the energy equation, what we're solving for is the delta P. So that means P1 minus P2. So just substituting in that we're going to have 8.5 meters of elevation increase and also working against 15.978 meters of friction loss. That means that the pressure change is going to be 240 kilopascals between those two points. So the pressure upstream at location one is higher than the pressure downstream at location two. So there's less pressure at two. All right, we're out of time. I will see you on Wednesday.